this is what your chest looks like. Your actual chest looks something more like this, but this is what an illustrated version of your chest looks like. It's composed of two heads, an upper or clavicular head and a lower or sternal head. The upper head attaches along the clavicle and the lower head along the sternum. And just notice how the fibers run. This is important because it's this structure that determines what the muscle does and in turn, how you should train it. In particular, notice how the upper fibers run downward or descendingly. The mid fibers run straight across or transversely and the lower fibers run upward. If you just imagine the fibers of the sternal head contracting or shortening. They will pull to bring the origin and insertion points closer to one another. So basically it will bring the upper arm over and across the body, something called transverse shoulder adduction. Transverse referring to the horizontal plane of motion, shoulder referring to the joint where the rotation happens, and adduction meaning movement towards the body's midline. You can think of it like adding as you bring the body parts closer to one another. Because the upper fibers run descendingly, they also assist in shoulder flexion or bringing the arm straight up like in a front raise. It's common to hear bodybuilders criticize the flat bench as a bodybuilding movement, but the literature is actually largely in support of its use as a mass builder for the pecs. It seems to be the case that people with a big bench have big pecs. People with a big bench have big pecs. Bada boom, bada bing. 21. March hit. Send a hit, shoot up your car shit. Put them blue tips in that cartridge. 21. We put them drums in them cartridge. 21. King Kong ain't got shit on me. Let's go fuck them. Hey, Jack! Hey, kids! Where I can take when I arch attack, I parch your neck. Got birds on deck, that Xanax flow, make the night your head. Like a rammer blow, you in check. My words are fast like insects. I wake up feeling like you won't be right. I know, but no, but no, that shit don't feel right. An idea that's supported by the scientific literature. In 2014, Agaki et al. concluded that pec size was tightly correlated with one rep max strength on the bench press. It's also really good at activating the pecs, as many studies looking at EMG research have shown. A study by Agasaura et al. was able to show that a program containing bench press as the only exercise was very effective at making the pecs grow. And because a powerlifting arch positions the upper back in a sort of decline position, this is probably a good way to elicit very high levels of overall pec activation, especially when the intensity is relatively high. And since a well-developed upper chest is really important for creating that iconic pec shelf look, it's important to include some movements that directly target the upper pecs. Recall that because of the way the upper fibers run, they contribute more to shoulder flexion, which means that they're more active when you press on an incline. And just notice how the incline bench closes the shoulder adduction angle, and as a result creates a more significant shoulder flexion moment than the flat bench. This is why incline presses are better for the upper pecs. As for what angle to use, this is something you may have to experiment with, but I'd recommend starting with what Trebs et al. found to elicit the highest level of EMG activity in their 2010 paper, which was roughly 45 degrees. There are multiple other ways you can target the upper chest as well, such as using a close grip, which I discuss in more detail in my chest hypertrophy program. Every muscle has a resting length at which it can most forcefully contract. This is called the length tension relationship of a muscle. In simple terms, if you stretch a muscle too much past its resting length, it will lose strength. And if you shorten it or contract it too much, then it'll get weaker too. So when you externally rotate, you lengthen the pec a little bit, putting it in a sort of less optimal position to contract. So when you internally rotate the pecs, they're in a better position to contract more forcefully. This is why it makes sense to do cable flies with the thumbs facing one another, with the palms facing down, which is a movement called the Bayesian cable fly. Also, the upright support of the bench can restrict cheating and allow for scapular retraction and a correspondingly safer shoulder position. In his landmark 2010 review on the topic, Brad Schoenfeld outlined three main mechanisms of hypertrophy, mechanical tension, muscle damage, and metabolic stress. Since tension is likely to be the most important factor, it should be given attention early in the workout by presenting the muscles with a heavy overloading stimulus, one that gets bigger on average from week to week or month to month. A good way to further optimize metabolic stress is by lengthening the rep duration in the stretched position, preventing venous return from the muscle to the heart. By doing flat dumbbell isometric holds at the end of a session, not only do you allow for metabolite
overweight buildup in the muscle, which can signal for hypertrophy, you also present a novel way of progressively overloading by adding time under tension at a fixed load. Because long sets can generate significant fatigue and impede performance on subsequent exercises, it makes most sense to save these techniques for the end of a session and use them as a sort of finisher exercise. The most recent and comprehensive meta-analysis on frequency concluded that training two times per week is better than one time per week for maximizing growth. And as I see it, it's still very much up for debate whether or not frequencies of three or more are better. And I think that the answer for the pecs will really come down to how much weekly volume you need to cram in. I think that for 99% of folks, a twice per week frequency given sufficient weekly volume and training intensity will be enough to optimize growth. And while volume guidelines will be individual, I do give specific guidelines on how to set this up in my chest hypertrophy program, which is linked in the description and at the end of the video. So thank you so much for listening, guys. I hope that you enjoyed the informative section of the video, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the vlog. What is going on, everyone? I hope everybody had a wonderful holiday. I just want to give you guys a quick thank you uh, for watching the video, and also thank you for your continued support as the channel grows. Um, I couldn't be more excited about how everything is going right now. Also, like I did mention in the video, uh, my chest hypertrophy program is now available. You can just click this box over here, and it'll take you to my website. That's also linked down in the description. The idea with the program is to just cover in more detail the application side of the theory that was covered in this video. You'll get scientific references with everything explained. You'll also get access to technique videos from me. So I go in the gym and explain and show you guys how to do all the exercises included in the program. And also supporting me on projects like this is a great way to help me make more videos and higher quality videos. Uh, so if you like the content that I'm producing here and you think it's something that you're not really seeing anywhere else, um, supporting me on projects like this is a great way to ensure that I have more content coming. And also guys, if this video gets 10,000 likes, I will redo the 10,000 calorie challenge and I plan to make it informative again. Stephanie said that if it gets 20,000 likes, uh, she'll do the 10,000 calorie challenge with me and we'll both make it super informative. So make sure you go down and hit the thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thank you guys so much once again for watching and I will see you in the next video. Yeah.